Um, so we're starting this new series called Good Vibes. This is our summer series. And summer is a season that represents kicking back, relaxing. The days are long and sunny, and there's more fun things, fun things to do. The kids are out of school looking to enjoy their time off. Summer is really a time that many of us look forward to, right? The winter and the springtime could possibly be very busy. Sometimes in the winter, we just kind of hibernate and do not much. And then the spring hits and all the sports and everything, and we're running all to different places. Then we finally get to summer where we have a time to go to the beach, maybe go out on the boat, go on a vacation, go out to dinner at a place where you can actually eat outside, right? Go to a barbecue. It's just that time of like good vibes, the summer. So generally speaking, summer can be that time that we feel happy and we feel those kind of good vibes. And if, if, you're, if, if you're aware of the culture, people use that term all the time, good vibes. And basically what it means is the people, places, ideas, possibilities that are evoked are positive, safe, and happy, right? We all like that. So this summer, in our summer topical series, I want to find out what the scriptures teach about how we can give out good vibes so that we can show other people Jesus. Because that's going to be our main point as a believer, right? We want to show other people Jesus, so we want to be people of good vibes. So the tagline is this, showing people the sun, right, S-O-N, by giving out good vibes. So what we're going to do is we're going to learn the habits of people that actually give out good vibes. You know those people. Some of you are those people. But the people that are the healthiest for us to be around are the people that give out good vibes. So you might not always gravitate towards people that give out good vibes, and part of the reason why is because misery loves company, okay? Maybe you're not the type of person that's giving out good vibes, so you're not bringing people around you that give out good vibes, because guess what? Like attracts like, right? Positive people attract positive people. Negative people attract negative people. So if you're around a lot of negative people and you're complaining about that, you might be the negative person that is attracting them to you. So for the first way that we're going to learn how to give out good vibes is this. Don't complain. Now I'll have to say, I am excited to deal with this topic, and I was excited to study this topic because it is something that I personally struggle with. And some people might be like, I don't see you as a complainer. There's a lot going in here, uh, on in here that you don't know about, okay? So I'm complaining sometimes, and it's not coming out of my mouth, but it's in here. So I was excited to really study this and kind of do some research, biblical research and outside research, to kind of find out about this complaining thing. Because guess what? People that complain, they don't really send out good vibes. They actually send out bad vibes. And people that send out bad vibes don't show people Jesus. They just show people how miserable they are, right? So the first thing we have to do is figure out if you are a complainer. So some of you just admit it at this point. You say, yeah, I'm a complainer. What else would I talk about, okay? That's your, you realize you're a complainer. But others of you don't think that you are a complainer. So through some of the research that I did, I came up with a seven-question test that you're going to give yourself today, right now. Please don't answer out loud, and please don't point at anybody <laughs> around you. So the first question is this. If you are a complainer, is irritation your normal response to most events, okay? You're normally irritated by things. Whatever it is, your normal response is irritation. Like, oh, I can't believe this, or oh, this is so annoying. Like, if that's your normal response. Second is, are you always thinking and saying statements like, here is how this could be better? Okay, here is how this could be better. Now, some of you, like myself, like I tend to be a critical thinker, so it, I don't always feel like that's complaining, but if you're always looking at a situation saying, here's how this could be better, like you're in kind of like the negative rather than the positive. The next is this, are you overly critical of others? Are you always looking at the, the way people live, like what they spend their money on, how they raise their kids, what they do with their life? What, are you always critical, like, oh, I'm pointing the finger kind of in your mind, maybe even to your spouse or to other people, but you're critical of others. The next is, do you expect disappointment? 
Like, do you expect to be disappointed? You look at some situation or, you know, an opportunity you have, and you expect to be disappointed. I remember when I was, uh, when, when our kids were younger, and most of you know our kids are really close in age, or two years apart. So our kids would be like two, four, and six, and somebody would be like, hey, you guys want to come over to a barbecue? And I'd be like, ugh. <laughs> like, I got kids, two, four, and six. I'm not going to be able to eat a plate of food. You know what I mean? Like, there's going to be a mud puddle in the backyard, and they're going to find it and then jump in it, and then I'm going to have to give them an extra bath for that day. And, like, I would just think, like, I'm crazy, <laughs> okay? <laughs> so here's the thing. Do you expect disappointment? Here's one. Do upbeat and happy people annoy you? <laughs> my college roommate, my first college roommate, super grumpy guy. The sweet mates on the other side of the bathroom were super positive guys. One of the first days that we were there, I'm sleeping. We hear them in their room, like, singing and getting ready for, for classes. <laughs> and my roommate literally gets up, slides open the bathroom door. The one guy goes, good morning, and I hear thump. My roommate threw him on the floor. <laughs> he was upbeat and happy people made him very annoyed. Is that you? Do, when somebody's like, hi. <laughs> Number six, do you tend to focus on the negative? Is the glass half empty? Okay, do you tend to focus on the negative? And number seven is this. Have you ever posted a social media rant? Okay, if you're on social media, you know what a rant is. That's when you just complain to everybody as if they care, okay? Have you ever done this? Like you just complain about the world and life and the person on the road or whatever? Let me just tell you, if you answered yes to at least four of these, I hate to break the news to you, but you're a complainer, okay? I had a bunch of people, I was talking to some of the teenagers that were in the first service, they were like, I got five, Pastor Mike. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> you're still young, you have time to work on this, yeah. <laughs> so guess what? Complainers send out bad vibes, okay? That's what they do, they send out bad vibes. A great example of a group of complainers were the people of Israel. Now, God's people were in slavery in Egypt. The Lord rose up Moses to deliver them out of slavery in Egypt. And one final act of deliverance was when the Egyptians were chasing after them to bring them back. They were in between the Egyptians and the Red Sea, and Moses parted the Red Sea miraculously. The people of Israel walked through and escaped the Egyptians. I want you to look at Exodus, Exodus chapter 16. So they were in slavery, now they're not in slavery, and this is what that happened. Exodus 16, verses 1 through 3 says this. They set out for Elam, and all the congregation of the people of Israel came to the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai, on the 15th day of the second month after they had departed from the land of Egypt. And the whole congregation of people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. Let's think about that for a second. The whole congregation. That's a lot of people. There were tens of thousands of people. Just imagine if everybody just in this room complained, okay? A lot of complaints were going on. Verse 3, And the people of Israel said to them, would that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt when we sat by our meat pots and ate bread to, full, to, to the full. For you have brought us out into the wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. So their main complaint was, you know what, we're out of slavery, but we're hungry. We had better food in slavery. So that's what their complaint was to Moses. Are we going to die of starvation here? Some of you know the rest of the story. God told Moses, I'm going to rain down manna, bread from heaven every day, and I'm going to provide for my people, and they will not die hungry, okay? They will not die hungry. I'm going to provide for them. But eventually, most of you know the rest of the story. They got tired of manna. Then they started to complain about manna. So basically what happened was this was a long list of complaints based upon what they were experiencing, their situation. But Psalm 106 gives us a recap of how the people of Israel sinned against God. But the bottom line is this. In Psalm 106, verse 7, it says this. Our fathers, when they were in Egypt, did not consider your wondrous works. They did not remember the abundance of your steadfast love 
but they rebelled by the Red Sea. So basically what was happening here, the psalmist was saying is here was their problem. They did not consider the wondrous works of God. Here's what they did. They looked at their situation and they complained. They didn't consider the good things that God has done. They looked at their situation and complained about it. They were a bunch of people that forgot about God. They complained about their situation. You know what? Maybe right now you're looking at your situation and saying, yeah, you know what? You're looking at their situation and saying, yeah, they shouldn't have done that. But when it comes to your personal situation, you might be thinking, you know what? I do have a good reason to complain. I do have something to complain about. I can be negative. Or maybe you're thinking this. Well, what's the big deal if I complain? Who does it really hurt anyway? Well, let me just tell you. The truth is, when we complain, the first person we hurt is ourselves. I don't know if you realize this, but your complaints actually hurt you. So I did a little research, looked up some studies and stuff. There was an emotional intelligence website called talentsmart.com. They posted an article, and it, the article was entitled this, How Complaining Rewires Your Brain. How Complaining Rewires Your Brain. The article states that the damage you do to your health, the article uh, states that there's damage that you do to your health. Listen to what it said. It says this, Repeated complaining rewires your brain to make future complaining more likely. Over time, you find it easier to be negative than to be positive. Regardless of what's happening around you, complaining becomes your default behavior. You get that? So basically what, what it's saying is your brain is used to being negative, okay? And some of you are like, that's me. And some of you are like, that's my wife. That's my husband. <laughs> So your, your brain is used to it. But basically what's happening is like science is finding out, and we know all truth is God truth. Science is finding out. It's the negativity actually kind of trains our brain to do this behavior, to make it our default behavior. Then it goes on to say this. Complaining damages other areas of your brain as well. Research from Stanford University has shown that complaining shrinks the hippocampus. This is an area of the brain that's critical to problem solving and intelligent thought. Damage to the hippocampus is one of the primary brain areas destroyed by Alzheimer's. So think about that. So you're actually causing your brain to not function properly. Additionally, when you complain, your body releases the stress hormone cortisol. The extra cortisol released from the frequent complaining impairs your immune system, makes you more susceptible to high cholesterol, diabetes, heart disease, and get this, obesity, okay? If it even makes the brain more vulnerable to strokes. So now you thought you were just complaining, okay? But here's what's happening. You're actually damaging your health. Your constant negativity is making you an unhealthy person. So you hurt yourself. The next is you hurt other people. Moses and his brother Aaron, they were complained against. They were complained about. God's people were not an encouragement to them. And guess what? It hurts. You know, when you complain about your situation or about a situation or about a person, it can hurt their feelings. It can discourage them. Parents, you know this feeling, right? If you're a parent here, you know this feeling. You do everything for your kids, right? But they find something to complain about. You're just like, ah, I can't believe you're complaining. But look at what I've done. And, and like, you know, remember being a kid, you're like, of course, you're supposed to do that stuff. You're my parent and I'm supposed to complain because I'm the kid. Well, they're not supposed to complain, right? They're not, but we know that their complaints hurt. Kids, likewise, you might feel like, oh, I've done this or that for my parents, and they always point out what I did wrong in the situation or how I didn't do it the best way possible or like them, but those complaints hurt. Maybe bring it to work. Your complaints at work offend and discourage your coworkers. Maybe complaints around the house can... Um, can offend or discourage your family members. Maybe complaints in your friend group offend or discourage and hurt other people. When you think about it, when you're issuing a complaint, you can hurt other people. And here's the problem. If that science is true, that our brain is kind of, kind of used to and our habit is complaining, 
oftentimes we complain and we don't even know it. Like this week when I was dealing with all this stuff, I was like literally trying. Okay, I was like, okay, I want to like try to point out in my life when I complain. I was like, dang, I complain a lot. Okay, I didn't even realize it. Like I'm going to say something and that that's a compl- like I got to really like reframe how I even speak sometimes. So I realized that in your mind, your intention with a complaint is not to hurt other people. But unfortunately, whether you intend to hurt or not, the damage is done. So think about that for a second. We hurt ourselves. We hurt other people. But we also actually sin against and offend God. Now, in Numbers chapter 11, it records the discipline that came upon the people of Israel because they were complaining. Scriptures actually say this discipline came because of their complaints. It was a sin against God. The people of Israel did not look like God's people, and God's desire for them was to follow him, but they did not because they were complaining. They were offense to him. Here's here's what basically is happening. When we do not praise the Lord for the good that he has done, and we complain about the situation we are in, guess what? It's an offense to him. It's almost like God, being our loving parent, is looking at us and saying, okay, Look at all the good that I've rained down on you, basically. And you're going to focus in on that. Think about that. Whatever situation you're in, now back up and say, look at all the good. Now I'm going to focus in on that one negative thing. Or maybe it's two or three negative things. Basically, it's an offense to God. He's saying, look at all the good, and you just ignore it. I don't think any of you want to live like this. And if you have been living like this, and you're honest with yourself, you're finally to the point where you can say, okay, I don't want to live like that. How can can this change? How can I give off good vibes and not bad vibes? Because again, we want to be people that send off these good vibes, which will be healthier for us. It will be healthier for our relationships, and it will be pleasing to God. But most importantly here, what we're doing for this series is it's showing people Jesus. Nobody says like, hey, I want to hang out with that person. They complain all the time. It's so much fun to listen to them. (laughs) Nobody says that, okay? And the only people that would say that are people that complain as well. But I would even venture to say, if you're a complainer, you probably don't even like to be around complainers. Eventually, you kind of feel like exhausted after you're with them. So the scriptures give us guidance, and that's where we're going to go. The scriptures give us guidance on how to curb our complaining. So the first way that we do that is we need to see others as image bearers of God. Many of our complaints focus in on other people, right? How they treat us, what happened in a relationship. Maybe people annoy you. Maybe they're harsh with you. Maybe they're inconsiderate. Maybe they're difficult to handle. Sometimes we feel justified. Of course I'm going to complain about them because they're obviously something to complain about. So we justify it. Or maybe you feel a little bit better about complaining. Like, I had to get this off my chest. I feel better about this. So we justify the complaining. But James 5, 9 says this. It says, Do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. So God puts this in the sin camp, right? He's talking to believers in James. But he says, Do not grumble against one another. Do not complain against one another. 1 Peter 4, 9 says it this way. It says, Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. You ever invite somebody over your house, but you don't want them there? Okay. It's a good verse for you to remember. Okay. Show hospitality without grumbling. Okay. But here's here's what we need to do. When we take people in general, whether they are a believer or an unbeliever, what we need to do is we need to remember that they are image bearers of God. The difference between us and animals, do you realize this? We are in God's image, okay? Animals are not. So that means every person that you know, whether they're a believer or not, are created in the image of God. We know that believers are children of God because we've been brought into his family, right? But everybody in this world is created by God and they're image bearers of God. So in that case, we have to see something in them of an attribute of God, something that we can admire, something that we can celebrate, something that is good. We need to look at them as an object 
of God's love. That's someone that God created in his image. When you look into the face of another human being, no matter who they are, they are created in the image of God. So now when we start to look at people like that, does it change the way we treat them? Could you imagine looking into the face of God and treating God badly? I hope you wouldn't want to do that. So, so now when we're dealing with these people that we want to complain about or complain to, we have to look and say, this is someone that God has created. This is someone that God loves. The next thing we need to do is we need to be thankful. If you're struggling with complaining, you need to be thankful. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18 says it this way. It says, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ for you. There's a few things. It says, rejoice always, then he says, pray and be thankful. Obviously, we need to pray without ceasing in order to be thankful. We need to pray in order to not complain because we can't do this on our, se- uh, on our own. But what he's saying is, you need to be thankful in all circumstances, a reminder of what God has done. Now, I know this is difficult because you look at your circumstance that you're complaining about and you're like, there's nothing to be thankful about. So now you have to look at that circumstance and say, okay, what can I learn from this? How can I be thankful to the Lord for this situation in my life? Rather than complaining about it, which, by the way, does absolutely nothing for you, but hurt you, hurt others, and offend God. So now you have to look and say, In this situation, what can I be thankful for? But not only that, not only the situation, because maybe in the situation, I will give you this, maybe there's a situation where you're just like, I do not see anything that I could be thankful for. But what I would suggest at this point is this. Celebrate things in your life that you can be thankful for. That uh, same website, that Talent Smart, from that article Um, secular studies support biblical truth about thankfulness. Okay, And, and here's what it says. It says, cultivate an attitude of gratitude. That is, when you feel like complaining, shift your attention to something that you're grateful for. Taking time to contemplate what you're grateful for isn't merely the right thing to do. It reduces the stress hormone cortisol. Research conducted at the University of California, Davis, found that people who work daily to cultivate an attitude of gratitude experience improved mood and energy and substantially less anxiety due to lower cortisol levels. Anytime you experience negative or pessimistic thoughts, you use this as a cue to shift gears and to think about something positive. In time, a positive attitude will be a way of life. Hear what he's saying here? Hear what the study's saying? Is when you're like tempted to complain or you're ready to complain, you need to shift and say, okay, what can I focus in on that I'm thankful for? What can I focus in on that I'm thankful for? Rather than, than ruminating on this, and I know this is a problem for many of us, right? Okay, because we get kind of in that pattern, in that rut, where we continue to complain and complain and complain, and we focus in on it rather than focusing in on the good things in life or the good things that God has given us. Now, here's a practical tip for you. Keep a gratitude journal. Keep a grat- You might have heard this in the Christian community we talk about, in the secular community they talk about. A gratitude journal, just spending time in your day just jotting down. It doesn't have to be a paper journal. You could do it on a note on the phone. But here's the thing. Spending time, what am I thankful for? Um, what am I thankful for? I mean, some of you who have been sick before, when you're sick, right, you're miserable. You're like, I can't believe I'm sick, this and that. And then when you're healthy, you're like, I'm so glad I'm healthy, right? But how many of you thank God that you're healthy this morning? If you haven't been sick in the last few weeks, you probably didn't. You probably didn't focus in on, man, I'm healthy. Today, I'm healthy. None of us think that way. But when we have a gratitude journal or, or when we're practicing thankfulness, we're saying like, you know what, Lord, I'm thankful I'm healthy today. Thankful that I can pay my bills. I'm thankful that even though maybe my kids are annoying me right now and I want to complain about them, I'm thankful that I'm not driving back and forth to a hospital with them. Like, here's the thing. We have to be thankful for the good that's going on. It's so easy to focus in on the negative. Why not focus in on the positive? The Christian leadership author Zig Ziglar said it this way. He said, be grateful for what you have 
and stop complaining. It bores everyone else. Does you no good and doesn't solve the problem. Think about that. You have these complaints and you tell a friend, you know, sometimes your friends are just like, dude, I'm sick of you. <laughs> like, because all you do is complain. You're sending out bad vibes, man. Not good vibes. So instead of complaining, be thankful. The next thing we need to do is practice contentment. Let me just tell you, things will not go your way. Most of you are old enough to realize this. Things will not go your way. We will not get what we want, and there will be plenty of letdowns in life, okay? If someone prepared you for that when you were younger, they did a good job, okay? Because guess what? Life can be a long string of wants and desires that are never had and letdowns, right? But we need to have a sense of peace during those times. We need to have a sense of peace. The Apostle Paul teaches us in Philippians 4, 11 through 13. Remember, Paul was in prison when he wrote this. He says this, I've learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of fa facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. Listen to what he says. Big popular verse. The secret of his contentment. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. You can't do this on your own. You can't fake happiness, right? But you can go to the Lord for the strength. You know what, Lord? I got to be content in this situation. This is what's going on right now. I need your strength to be content and have peace in this situation. I can spend all my days complaining about it, but it's going to do me no good. It's going to hurt others, and guess what? I'm not going to give out good vibes to anybody. So I can do all things through you. Get me through this. Help me through this. Heal me in this. Give me peace through this. Give me the strength that only you can give. And that's what Paul found. He was in jail and he said, you know what? There's going to be good times. There's going to be bad times. But I'm going to be content because Jesus is giving me strength. We practice contentment by drawing on the strength of Jesus. And finally, follow the example of Jesus. Now, if nothing else spoke to you, this should. Isaiah 53, 7 says this about the crucifixion of Christ. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Think about this. Jesus Christ, the God-man, came to this earth to die for us sinners. And when he was being mocked, when he was being beaten, when he was being crucified, he opened not his mouth, meaning he did not issue a complaint. He did not say, these people stink. They don't deserve it. He did not say any of those things. He didn't say, some will reject me. Why am I doing this? Didn't say any of those things. He didn't issue any of the complaints that any of us would wind up issuing. The example of Jesus was he did this for our behalf. He did this on our behalf. He died on the cross to pay the price for our sins. Three days later, rose again to prove that he was God. The Bible says all who believe will have eternal life. The example of Christ was this, that he did this hard job and didn't complain about it. So now in Philippians 2, 14 through 15, it says this, do all things without grumbling or disputing. Do what without grumbling and disputing? All things. That means go to work. That means parent. That means deal with issues and situations in your life. All things. I can't think of anything that doesn't fall under all things, okay? So that means that there's no room for my grumbling and disputing. I'm supposed to do these things without grumbling and disputing that you may be, and this is why, that you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of the crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. Guess what? When you do this, you give out good vibes, right? You shine as a light. People look at you and say, man, I know what that person's going through. And they're not grumbling. They're not complaining. They're different. There's something about them that's different. There's something in them that I want. There's something going on that's not going on in me, but going on in them, and I want what they have. Or you just go to your default, right? Send out the bad vibes. Be like everybody else. What's wrong with the world? 
You know, it's funny because after the 8.30 service, not many people talked on the way out. I was like, this is great. Because people will, like, it's a little hot out. It's a little humid. And not, not knocking the 8.30 service people because it's between each service, right? But I was like, you know what? Sometimes we just have to practice that little old adage that our moms, right? If you don't have anything nice to say, right? I'm saying keep it shut, okay? Don't say anything at all, right? See, in our culture and generation, right, this crooked and perverse or this crooked and twisted generation, there's so much to complain about, right? We don't want to be those Christians, do we? That are just complaining about everything. We're not going to be a light. We're not sending out good vibes. We want to be the people that bring people to the Lord, not repel people from him. So in our culture and generation, there's plenty of things to complain about. But when we don't complain, we give out good vibes and show other people Jesus the Son.